It's Chris Oatley's ArtCast, Episode 75. An interview with Pascal Campion, Part 2. Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of Chris Oatley's ArtCast, the show that goes inside the hearts and minds of successful professional artists. I'm Chris Oatley. I was a visual development artist at Disney before I quit to start my own online art school, the Oatly Academy of Concept Art and Illustration. Find more art instruction and career advice from some of the most inspiring voices in animation, games, comics, and new media at chrisoatley.com. That's C-H-R-I-S-O-A-T-L-E-Y dot com. In part one of this interview, we learned about Pascal Campion's early career and his development into a uniquely versatile professional artist. In this episode, Pascal manages to communicate to us how his creative mind actually works, which is extremely difficult to do, I know from experience. He also shares some stirringly thoughtful responses to questions from my color theory and digital painting students. We talk about portfolios, art school, composition, lighting, and of course, personal style. It's the best 75th episode I could have imagined. Our stories are very similar in the sense that the anticipation of children is, you know, a game changer. A big, big part of that being practicing better habits before the kids actually get here. So not trying to change everything all at once. And uh, that was part of it. And then I've already talked about this before, but, you know, I had a really awful kidney stone uh, back in August. Yeah. And it put me out for a month. I fell so far behind on the magic box that there was nothing I could do. Nothing I could do except record an audio message to my students while I was like on painkillers and go, Aww. guys, I'm so sorry. But I, <laughs> I mean, life just shut me down, you know, and it was amazing because it, you know, me getting uh, just taken out by this major health issue and a subsequent surgery. I mean, it took me literally, I was in bed for, with the exception of a few days, basically a month, you know, so, so just being hammered like that. And then this awareness that not only is this not sustainable in case I ever do, God forbid, get, have some other health issue in the future. So the, the, the business has to do a better job of running on its own. Um, but also it's like, I can't be an effective father this way. It's just not, I mean, it's never going to happen. I'll, I'll be, um, Rob Pratt who, you know, did, um, Superman classic was saying in an interview, he didn't want to be the dad who the kids knew. He's the guy who's at his desk all day. Right. Yeah. I remember that just, you know, shocking me just being like, Oh my, that's no, I don't want that either. You know, it's got to change. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's funny. This past couple of weeks have been for the job I was working on. I worked from home. The reason I did this is because my daughter draws just as much as I do. So we were like sitting at the dining room table and she was sitting right across from me and she was running with me. Oh, man. And, you know, I was saying that is the most awesome feeling in the world. As I was drawing, my, my boys would come up and climb on my chair and like ask me all those questions about what I was doing and ask me if they could draw with me while I was actually producing work for a feature film. And I was just thinking, this is the best thing in the world. And I was able to like go around, tickle them and play with pillows and just build forts while during the day I was still producing a lot of work. Yeah. And I was thinking, this is great. This is fantastic. And I felt like that was a good way to like marry both. And at four o'clock, I just stopped (laughs) and just went playing with them completely. So that's, is uh, it's it's so nice to be able to uh, to get this energy from because be able to like spend time with them and you know, it's just fantastic. Yeah, it is. It's great. Uh, oh, uh, freelance uh, and keeping your own schedule highly recommended as long as you can keep it in check and have it, your life not or you have your have your schedule not eat you alive. If that if you can maintain that balance, man, it is the best because you don't have to answer to you know other. Well, a lot. You still have to answer to other people and other factors, but it's way different. It's way different than just clocking in every day. 
It, yeah, it's absolutely a completely different thing. Also, your sense of like motivation is completely different. Working at a company, the, the few times I've done that, after a while, your personal self worth is is different, or mine at least. I was I would get angry or upset with my uh, superiors because you know I didn't particularly appreciate the way they were handling particular issues. I I, I didn't feel as committed to the product. Uh, as I guess I should have. Well, you're a freelancer. I, at least for me, I feel much more inclined to give my best shot uh, job because I know I, just my job, which I did not do that at all at companies. So that's very interesting. That makes makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, so I just launched uh, Painting Drama 2, my advanced color theory class, and we had our very first class meeting this past Saturday, and it was awesome. And I asked some of the Painting Drama 2 students, they're, they're all rock stars, they're, they're amazing. Um, I asked them if they uh, had any questions that they wanted me to ask you. So they've got some fantastic questions that I know you're going to love here. Amy wants to know what common issues that you see in uh, when you're doing portfolio reviews? Are, are there patterns that you see coming up uh, over and over again? The one pattern I see coming up over and over again is that like, I can tell from which school the students are coming from like 90% of the time. Yeah. Because they show inside of it, the exercises that they've done, the exercises that they do in class are mostly there to help them figure out things about lighting, composition, staging. I don't think they're meant to be an end to it all. So what they're showing me is just the ability. They're showing me an exercise that tells me that they've worked on this particular thing. But it doesn't tell me anything about who they are. And that's that's the pattern I see. What, what I'm saying by this is like what I'd rather see in a portfolio is like using what you learn from this exercise to create a piece that is very touching, something that is moving for yourself, like grandma's 60th birthday or the first time you had a dog and see how you can use all those elements you've, you've, you've learned about and how you can use them for your own stories to create stories that actually touch me. So when I see all those exercises, especially, you know, when, when I see, and I don't want to name any schools, but there's particular schools that have a has density, like those, those like exploded views of houses with like the light coming from the window on one side and this darker light coming on the other side. And all portal fields have that in them. And then, and then variations on the same tree or the same fence or the same bicycle uh, over three pages. It's, it's a little uninteresting to me if I'm reviewing portal photos. I'm not saying that to other people is not interesting. For me, it's not interesting because it doesn't say anything about you. And at this point, it's just uh, visual noise I'm looking at. It's really hard for me to give you feedback because all, yeah. all I'm going to say is like, oh, I like this fence better than this one. Great. Hey, the ability to draw should be a given for you. And by this, I'm not saying that you should be able to draw like Michelangelo or Donatello or whatever to just name them. the turtle ninjas. Yeah. Didn't I? <laughs> but when you show me a portfolio, I don't want you to tell me that you can draw that I'm taking that for granted that you have a certain way of representing things graphically. What I want you to show me is what you can do with those drawings, that's going to make me fall in love with your art. What's going to make me fall in love with you. And what I fall in love with are emotions, stories, stories that touch my heart. If you're going to come and show me a stick figure portfolio that will make me go like, oh my freaking God, this is the best story I've ever seen in my life. I'm going to fall in love with you. Actually, at CTN, this one guy came up and he had this, the, he was presenting a, a story portfolio that was basically just stick figures. And I loved, loved, loved them. I actually introduced him to a few guys and he got a job. If you're going to show me something that's like incredibly well rendered, but I just don't yeah. relate to, I am going to be bored and I'm not going to remember you five minutes after you've gone by. The technique trap. The technique trap. Absolutely. That's a really good way of putting it. Technique trap. Technique is important. Uh, yeah. If it helps you bring forth your ideas, if it's just the technique for the sake of technique, then it is a trap. I saw something uh, the other day, someone emailed me, and if I remember correctly, they did not actually ask for me to give feedback on their portfolio, but they did have their portfolio link underneath their name or signature at, in the email. And uh, so I just, out of curiosity, I don't remember, I was waiting on something and I was like, oh, I'll click on the portfolio and I went to it. And it was, the paintings were really good. Technically, the technique was beautiful. It was a lot of uh, space wreckage kind of stuff, you know, crashed yeah. spaceship or whatever. And I was looking at it and I was going, wow, this is all so beautiful. And then I just wrote him back real quick and I said, but what are you offering the studio that they don't already have? 
Exactly. That's that's always something I tell them as well. It's like they have a thousand people that can do exactly that and probably ten times better than you can do. But what is it you're going to bring to the table that's going, that they don't have? The, the beautiful thing about this is that this sounds so cheesy, but it's true that the answer is inside you. <laughs> it's already there. You know, it's like your unique combination of experiences and tastes. And, you know, that's why I tweet these ambiguous tweets like let your freak flag fly, you know, because I'm trying to fan that flame of individuality that's going to hopefully infuse your paintings or drawings or whatever your art happens to be. I think that everybody has had experiences in their lives that are very personal, that everybody can relate to. You know, it's like the, uh, the universal personal thing where like, you know, everybody's fallen in love, but everybody's fallen in love in a very different way than anybody else. And that's, that's the simple thing. If you can like stay true to the feelings you had and bring those out, then you will actually reach someone. I mean, it doesn't matter how you do it. You, ha- you have to do it in a way that actually gets the point across and not just the point, but the emotions as well. That's where the technique is important in order to really refine that. But the technique does not need to be anything else than what you need to get a message across. Sometimes people just learn so much technique, then they have so many tools to say, you know, one thing. Then they overstay it and then you don't understand anything anymore. So it's like, it's like language. If you say, if I ask you, how are you doing, Chris? And tell me, I'm doing great. That's enough. But if you go on for a half an hour, tell me all the different ways of how great you are, then I'm going to start feeling like, well, hmm, this is a little weird. I'm a little bored now. I just want to get going. <laughs> if you have too much technique, it's like you have too much verbiage, basically. Yeah. You're like doing those like long sentences would really need three words to get the point across. Showing off. It's a bunch of showing off at that point. That's, a great point. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. You're doing a monologue. Shauna J.C. Tenney, who actually just uh, posted this week uh, at chrisoli.com about her personal project, she would like to know what you think about the dynamics of working in children's books versus the animation industry. Uh, what do you like about both, both industries and do you freelance in both? I do freelance in both. It's night and day, the difference. There, there are similarities, and, but there are major differences. One major, major difference I've noticed in, the, in publishing is the, uh, the speed. The, in publishing, you, I mean, I had like literally over a year to do this one book, which to me, I was just shocked because, you know, coming from commercials where everything is due like yesterday, uh, working trolls book is, is moving like a glacier speed. It's just very, 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 very slow. And then when you send them something, you expect them feedback, it's not going to come back for a couple of weeks. Your, your way of working is completely different. The nitty gritty is like the pay is also completely different. Uh, and you're not doing children's book for, for the pay, you just went for the love of it. As far as my experience go, the pay for children's book does not compare in any way to anything from animation or commercials or any other, any other uh, jobs I've ever had. The, the actual work itself is a, is a little bit different simply because you have more time to do it. Other than that, you're still trying to tell a story, or at least for me, I'm still telling a story. I'm still using pretty much the same tools, the same means. I tend to put more people, more uh, give a little bit more love to the images than, than I would do for animation. And since I don't really care whether it's animation or publishing, I, I still experiment a lot within the actual images I send for publishing. So. When does that children's book come out? Do you know when we'll be able to get our hands on it? This one comes out, I think it's, going to, it's a Christmas book, so it's going to come out probably around the Christmas time. This. Ah, right. Cool. Did you craft it any differently? As far as you were talking about drawing earlier or anything like that, or is it? does it still look like, will we be able to look at it and go, oh, I bet that's Pascal Campion? And you'll see, when you see it, it's like, it's the... Uh, the view, the images don't look like my daily sketches because when I do daily sketches, I have a very particular approach to the storytelling. And this particular one is more like you're following a story. So you're more involved uh-huh. in the story. You know, you have like more, uh, you have close ups, you have different shots. Well, you know, my daily sketches tend to have like a far away shot simply because I like doing it. It's my daily sketches, it's my world to play and do whatever I want to do. Yeah. And in, in the book, very much like an animation, my way of telling the story is a little bit more personal, a little bit more like tailored to the story. And I some point and a little bit more dramatic in some places. Uh-huh. But the, the style of it is still there. Yeah. Well, we're on the topic of your daily sketches. I am curious. Do you keep a log of ideas or do you just take the fresh idea every day? I take a fresh idea every day. That's why sometimes you have like ideas that repeat themselves quite often. And sometimes you have like totally off the wall ideas. Right. And, and sometimes I'm thinking to myself, like, oh, I should do this. And then when I go to it, I just don't feel like doing this or do something else or forget oh. about it. Uh, I, I don't keep a log. I should. Uh, but then again, when I do my daily sketches, the whole idea behind it is to stay fresh and spontaneous because it's 
you don't always get that chance and work. Right. Um, you know, in work, it's like you get 20, 30% of creativity and the rest of it is, is fixes and uh, redraws and, and uh, changing this and changing that, right? Right. <laughs> well, my daily sketches, I'm able to like just sit down every day and create something new every day. And once it's done, it's done. That, that's, it's, it's a phenomenally liberating exercise because everything goes. And I'm able to like test out so many different things, yeah. so many like uh, ideas and, you know, Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, but it doesn't really matter because there'll be another one like, tomorrow that might work or that might not work. And once again, that's for me. It's great if people see it and like them and, and share them and and, um, and things like this, but it was it's just really a way for me to explore and, and have fun and, 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 you know, I started yeah. drawing because I liked drawing. So I want to keep it like that. Have you considered joining up with the Sketch Daily's Twitter craze that is happening? I'm I'm curious. No, I, I, I follow them and I like them uh, very much. Like Daily Spit, Spit Paint, I follow them and I like them. I, I I'm not participating because I don't want to compete. Right. My daily sketches are not there for competition. They're there right. because I actually just like doing it. I, I feel like those group things are great, and I always started with like this the best intention in the world, but then inevitably someone's going to be better than another or someone's going to have more love than another and then it's going to have this like slight competition which uh-huh. is i'm not against people can do that it's great and it's definitely motivating for some people i, I don't function like that I, the competition thing just turns me off a little bit because you know i admire all the people in there i see all the sketches on the sketch deli i'm like oh my god that's great the bonnie and clyde i was looking at him, i was like oh my god some of those are amazing they're so cool uh, and i love seeing that and i just don't want to have to like compete with them i just want to be able to enjoy them without having to think to myself oh my god this guy's better than me or oh this guy is i can totally take them and no it's, I, I don't want to have to do that i just want to be able to enjoy it for what it is, a fun, fun thing. So. Man, that's awesome. That, that's important to just encourage a lot of the listeners to just take pause and let that sink in, that you have permission to not compete. That is a paradigm. Like, that is an option. Yeah, you know? it's funny. Uh, <laughs> you know, one thing about competition, I have to say, and, and uh, uh, that's just my own take on it, but I, I do think one of the reasons here in the States, because of the, the competitive spirit we have here in the States, it is one of the reasons why artwork tends, all artworks tend to look alike. It's because we compare ourselves to other artists and we're trying to do better than them. And in order to do better than them, we're trying to get the same uh, standards. And by doing those same standards, we tend to like stop trying to like explore different things. So for instance, you take comic book superheroes and they all tend to look alike. To some external reader, they are all exactly the same. Uh. But to the personal artist, they're all vastly different one from the other. But the reason for that is because we have the same standard. Well, if you want to draw really well, you're going to base it off this particular Buscema character or John Byrne character or, or whatever from, from that era. And that's the way he drew stuff. So I'm going to draw better than that stuff. As opposed to like, if you don't compete with people, you're a little bit more free to explore things that no one else has explored. So obviously, you can't compare it to someone else. You're not going to be better or worse than someone else. You're going to be different. And I feel we there's a little bit of this sense of like, Freedom and expression is lost a little bit here in the States. When I look at portfolios, I see that a lot. Everybody's trying to be Nicolas Morlet. Everybody's trying to right. be like, you know, uh, Laura Le Beauvais or, or, yeah. or, uh, or Brittany, uh, Brittany Lee. And it, it's, it's because they, all of a sudden they feel like they want to be as good as that. Right. As opposed to be like the best you can be, which, you know, the best you can be has nothing to do with what Brittany is doing or with what, or what Nicolas Morlet is doing. The best you can be is about you. Basically, how much heart you can put into your drawing, how much of yourself you can put in, how how far you can take something and create something. So the uh, competition is is good in some areas, but not in all areas. That's 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 just my take on it. That's all. I, I completely agree, and especially when you get sort of tunnel vision, and that's the problem with competing or obsessing over too too much over. Uh, work that you admire at a very young age because you haven't necessarily figured out who you are even just as a person let alone an artist and therefore it's easy to just co-opt someone else's identity and i mean i did this i i I've said before i i traced ninja turtles that's what i that's what i did you know i i had my stick figure phase and i had some very interesting drawings i look back at on, on them now and they're stick figures but they're little creatures they're like stick creatures but they're really interesting and then i sort of lost 
all of that for a while through middle school and and early high school and just kind of doing a very kind of microwave leftovers version of what was popular in the 80s and then you know, later on I sort of came back around it was fundamentals that eventually saved me but the point being it's easy to become very um, you know, it, it, Stephen Silver was telling me um, recently that he was like, back when I was learning, it, you had to work harder to see the work of others, of the pros. Like you had to work harder to collect that work. You had to go yes. buy a Mort Drucker book or you had to go check it out at the library. There wasn't the sort of rapid, endless, infinite slideshow of amazing paintings or amazing techniques or whatever that we have now with the Internet. So therefore, it was slower, like the consumption of other people's art was slower and that forced you to just make more of your own stuff up because you had such a limit you had limited access and now it's easy to just binge all the time yeah that's interesting i what you said at the beginning there was i agree 100 percent, especially the way you said it to co-opt someone else's personality right. i mm-hmm. think that's this is what a great way of putting it because i think that's what all younger artists do simply because they're looking for a point to start which is also the, the, the hardest thing is to start to get going. So you just like, what a great way to go out to someone else's personality. And when you're young, impressionable, and you don't know who you are, exactly like you said, everything is better than you. So you try to grab someone else's style or even personality wise, not just art wise, but in general, you try to model yourself out something else. Yeah. I know that at one point I had to like for a whole year, stop looking at anything on the internet, any art, anything, because I felt my artwork was looking so much like other artists I liked uh, that I stopped. I literally stopped each time something yeah. would come up. I would try not to look at it, uh, and I would force myself to like just you know sketch, draw, or just explore different things, uh, even if I didn't like where I was going with that. Especially, in, especially in terms of the colors, because I, I, you know, believe it or not, I really wasn't good at color before. So, <laughs> well, that, that actually leads us to another question, actually two, and I'll just throw them both out there in case you know, it's the same answer, but uh, Jesse Kate Patterson says, how do you get the inspiration for your lighting setups? Is it something like film studies or plein air painting or photography? And then Tegan says, do you have any tips on making your color palette sing? So maybe those are the same answer. Maybe not. Well, no, it's funny because the first one was like three, three things you mentioned. None of them I do. I don't do plein air painting. I do photography and I don't do uh, video studies. So that's, that's really funny. <laughs> what I do is like uh, I walk around and I look, I look at my kids and I see how the light is playing on their face. I look at my wife and, you know, I see how beautiful she is depending on whichever light hits her. And she's, you know, she's always beautiful. So it's like, it's pretty easy. But I, I uh, look right now, it's raining a lot. So like I'll be like biking and I'll see like this, like on the road, the black road. And there's like the lights, just like the way they hit the road and go like deep deep into the road and I'm just I, and I feel like it's like magic you know I have this sense of like wonder and amazement when I'm walking around especially here in California or in the Bay Area because the light here is so incredibly yeah. beautiful that it's like I can't do two steps without seeing something I want to paint or draw <laughs> and so what I do when I see that is like I, I literally stop and I try to look at it and describe it with words in my head I think we actually talked about this when you came down to San Francisco, Chris, where I'll look at something like, for instance, when I am I, uh, the, the, the light hitting the road and I'm thinking, what exactly am I seeing here? I'm seeing there's black, there's white, there's red. And how is the light hitting? It's hitting vertically, which sometimes like saying things out loud or things in your head with words helps you understand what you're looking at. Yeah. Because a lot of times you just don't know. You think you're seeing something, but really when you actually describe it, you realize that you're actually seeing something else. And you also notice details that you would not necessarily notice if you don't actually either sketch it or pay real close attention to it. So, so describing things in my head helps me break them down in a way that I can understand. And when I go home, I actually try out what I've actually remembered from describing it. Uh, so for instance, if I see the slide hitting the road, I'll tell myself, okay, so this is where I am. I am about like 10 feet away from this. And I'm, I am about six feet, six, six feet once. I'm about this height from the ground. And I actually really tell myself all those things. And I'm hitting, seeing this car going forward and, and it's really, really dark on the, the car, but it's really light right next to the car. So that's the shadow and that's the light of the sky reflecting right there. And this light of the sky is kind of whitish, but not totally white. I see it white because, and I tried to tell myself, why do I see it white? Oh, because right next to it, it's super, super dark, but it's not really white because I see this white bag and this woman and it's totally whiter than this. So I do this. I, I play this game. I'm just trying to 
describe everything I see. And, you know, I've been doing it for a few years and actually forever, basically. So I get better at it. So I, get, I go faster at doing it. And now I, I'm able to actually like, oh, I'm seeing one thing that I really want to understand. Like, well, sometimes I'll bike and I'll see San Francisco in the distance and it's covered by clouds. And some of the tops of the buildings are shining because the light is coming through the clouds and hitting the top of the building. So I'll just stop and look at it and tell myself the top is golden and the rest is purple. It makes no sense, but it is. And right. that's how I'll draw those buildings. And oddly enough, when I draw them, they look like photos. I'm like, oh, that's amazing. Uh, <laughs> but still done in my own way. Yeah. So that, that's how I, I study lighting. And, and that happens like, you know, 24 hours a day, literally. Like it's, yeah. uh, it's almost like a running dialogue yeah. or monologue in, in, my, in the back of my mind. Uh, as I'm looking at you right now, I'm looking at my Wacom pen and seeing how the light is hitting on it. I'm just thinking about it because obviously we're talking about it. And I'll do that for drawing as well. Uh, before yeah. I did colors, I remember like, I remember this one particular instance. I was in France still. I was walking down, down downtown basically and this car was driving by me and I was realizing that as I was looking at the car in the distance and the car was turning around this huge bend, the wheels under the car would visually move from one side of the car to the other. And it looked, and, I, and if I focused on it, it looked like the wheels were actually moving alongside the, the surface of the car. And I was trying to describe to myself the feeling of it. And then I did, I came home and I did this animation of it just in, in, in single drawings, you know, sequential art of how it would move. And I remember thinking, my God, I understood how that moved just by observing it and describing it to myself. So I would look at buildings and try to figure out how they were built from the outside in, the inside out, you know, like where the back walls would be, the ones I can't see, I'm trying to like make them invisible in my head so that I can see the structure of it. And that's, that's also how I draw cities as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am pretty good at drawing cities, not because I've spent so much time drawing them, although I did. It's also because I, I just draw cubes and I try to figure out where the back things are. Uh, it's, it's very mechanical. You know, yeah. that's, that's, that's one of the things about drawing is like there's a mechanical approach to it which will make you go better. But the inspiration of like how you're going to use them is something that is always going to grow. The, the rest is you can learn, but the inspiration of it is different. Yeah, that's interesting because your your I mean your work certainly does not look mechanical, and you know that would have been my suspicion that there's a definite structure underneath as far as the way your mind is working, and that you're actually thinking of it in perspective and in a structural way. Do you think of your color and lighting and your composition simultaneously? Do you ever extract those two things in your process? Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. I, I, uh, I do extract them. Sometimes I'll sit down and I'll have a very clear idea of what we're going to do. And sometimes I'll just, like, at one time when I was watching football and I was nervous, I started drawing the city. That's the one you commented on once. And I just did, I really just did the, the structure and then the lighting came completely after. Uh, and I had no idea what, what I was going to do with the lighting, but it turned out that I, I created a composition that worked well with a particular type of lighting. And sometimes I have the lighting before I actually have any type of hmm. idea of what I want to draw, meaning that I, I know I want to do a certain type of, of, uh, of lighting or I want to try something and I'll just find an excuse to draw something just to support that. Uh, most of the time, though, I, I know I want to tell a story because I have a hard time drawing without wanting to tell a story. But sometimes yeah. it, sometimes I don't. Uh, but most of the time it's that. So it's I, I work many different ways. I just have this desire to create also, desire to explore and understand things. So it's, it's a mixture of how I approach things. Yeah. But it's definitely, there's some structure to it. And there's also a lot of exploration that are unstructured. Because sometimes I feel structure just stops me from finding things. Uh, so I'll, I'll purposely break my way of working. Or uh -huh. <laughs> I'll literally just like throw color all over what I've just did. And just yeah. try to like build something out of nothing, literally. Just just to get away from the structure, just to be sure I don't get stuck in doing always the same thing. Because, you know, I do that for work already. Not that I don't like work, but for work, when people hire me, they hire me on stuff that I've already done so then I can do it. They're, they're, people don't hire me to, you know, they don't hire me to do like, oh, you're going to do like golf images of uh, right. 50,000 vampires dying in, in, in the desert. It's like, I've never done anything like this or even remotely like this. So clients are not likely to ask me to do that, but they'll ask me to do relationships and right. they'll ask me to do like uh, nice, like sunset coloring and stuff like that. So I, I try exploring different things and breaking my own structures because I tend to have like a pretty strict structure as how I approach my, uh, my work, even yeah. if it doesn't look like it. I just don't ever move forward with a drawing or an idea unless I've given my best effort to ruin it. 
<laughs> I always try and I'm like, okay, if I'm happy with that, then I get suspicious. And I'm like, yes, absolutely. What, what am I doing that was predictable? What am I doing that my subconscious isn't that I'm doing just out of my subconscious and not out of my actual conscious mind? And, and sometimes it's like, oh, yeah, no, I actually I, I am fully happy with it. And there's not like an undercurrent of laziness or whatever. And then I'll move forward. But almost always I just go. Uh, how do we destroy this? And then I end up s- often with the, a similar or, or or the same idea, but it's there's just more power in it. You know, it's pushed further and there's something more interesting in the actual final image. Absolutely. It's funny because it's exactly like design. You know, when you get to design a new character, if you have like three days to do it, the first like day, like the first hundred drawings you're going to do are going to be... Oh, yeah everything that's like on the top of your subconscious and, and that's that's same thing with colors like the first and composition as well uh all types of art really like the first stuff you do is what you have that just lying there at the, the top of your subconscious and then once you get this out then you can start digging into something else and, and you're right sometimes the first shot is your best shot but most of the time yeah. there's something there below that you didn't know was there and that you have to dig out do you thumbnail no yeah just kind of dive in and wrestle with it yeah i found that when i do storyboards and things like that well i guess like this past week like i guess this past week all i did was thumbnails but that's that's pretty much what the job was right the sketches i was doing paper was uh was uh thumbnails i did a few color pieces but most of them were paper design which is you know the thumbnails have so much that's that's the cool thing about visual development it's like 80 percent of it doesn't have to be like beautiful images it's just getting the ideas out and trying to find the ideas and that's that's right. that's the cool part but when I did daily sketches, no, I, I don't thumbnail. I just, uh, <laughs> actually, yeah, I do. The thumbnails are what you see. Yeah, right. <laughs> <They're in this. laughs> Ivan Melitic from the Magic Box, he wanted to know if you have any personal projects, and I, I think what he means is a more of a long-term project like a children's book or something, you know, a long-term project that you want to do, but you haven't had time yet. Yes, absolutely. We have a bunch of projects. When I say we, it's it's my wife and I. Mm. One of the things that I did when I first had my daughter is like I refused to take all the bigger jobs. I started stopping like taking like major, major commercials or refused to take full time jobs at animation companies or, or feature film companies because I, I know because I've done it before. I know how time intensive it is. If I want to accomplish something epic, I know that I'll have to work or I'll want to work. Uh, 14, 15 hours a day and I'll be frustrated if I don't. So just for the sake of my own family, my own children, I don't want to do it just yet. So I'm pretty happy right now with the work I do. I'm pretty happy with the fact that I get so much work doing things that I can still do during the day and not have to work on the weekends, work at night and, and, and things like that and still be there for my kids. I have tons of projects, of course. Like I, I wrote scripts, I wrote treatments for movies, uh, for, for games. And, you know, they're when they're a little bit older and they're actually getting into the point now where they're starting to go to school, like the kids and the boys in two years will go to school full time, like Lily. Then I'll be able to, like, you know, do more trips, go to more conventions and take on bigger projects. Yeah. I've been offered to be production designer in a movie not too long ago. And it just I was, I was like thinking about it, but like, you know, it's still a little too early to to dive in and and, and just take on something of that magnitude just yet. And I'm one of the lucky ones where I can actually, I have the choice. I have a choice just yet. And, yeah. you know, if in three years from now, those doors closed and I'll do something else. Kellen wants to know your thoughts on going to a smaller art school and what, not just, is that okay, but what advantages do you have if you went to a lesser known school? Well, my point on this is that the school isn't a ticket. You are the ticket. Uh, meaning that you're going to get out of the school whatever you put into the school. You can go to art center and not work at all and come out and have no jobs and no skills and no anything and you have, you know, wasted four years of your life and you can go to a small school and work your butt off and just become like the best artist that you can ever be. The most important thing about a school, a physical school, I think, is that there's the ability of teachers. And um, the, the, what teachers do for you is that they give you feedback. Um, they're not going to do the work for you. They're, they're not going to turn into an artist. They're not going to make you. They're not, they're, you're not a piece of coal that they're going to transform into diamond. You do that yourself. And actually, you just do it every single day, whether you're in school or not. You just grow. What teachers are going to do is they're going to they're gonna help you, guide you on, on your journey to becoming a better artist. And note that I'm not saying 
and trying to become an artist, but a better artist. Typically, you go to an art school because you're already an artist and you're trying to be a better artist than what you are and just grow and understand what you are and who you are. And that's what teachers do. They help you with that. But an art school for me is there to help you grow as an artist. The big ones or the small ones don't matter. I think what matters is what you put into it and how you're going, how hard you're going to work or how smart you're going to use those tools. They're tools, basically. Schools are tools. They're here for you to like help you grow. But if you don't use them, if you let them do all the work for you, then it's not going to work. I've seen some amazing students come out of uh, Art Center, that's true. They have great technique, but you know, not all of them are great. Like last time I was at CTN and I saw 20 portfolios of art student, maybe one of them stood out. And I was thinking, oh my God, all those other 20 that have exactly the same portfolios, they're gonna be in trouble. Uh, they still have like maybe like two or three years of like, you know, all being the best, but then all of a sudden like, there'll be something else that's gonna come out that's gonna have a new look, new style, new great things going on about them. And that's, that's gonna be the new it thing. But there's always those like students that whether they come from art center or from San Jose State or from some small school in Mexico will come out and blow your mind because yeah. they've actually used the school to the best of their abilities. They've talked to their teachers. They've really thought about what they were trying to do. They've really been able to like separate the technique from the actual art and they've been able to like create something as opposed to just do the exercises. The best portfolios that I've seen, let's say I see at any given CTN, I see 10 great portfolios with every passing year the percentage of those great portfolios have come from a school i've never heard of or that i've hardly heard of exactly yeah yeah i agree and i feel like the schools that you mentioned the bigger schools will tend to bring the same type of portfolios right now which is not a bad thing it's like you know you need people to be able to do the production stuff but if you want to be something else, uh, if you want to be the best artist you can be, it's not about that. It's, it's about what you can put into your portfolio that's personal to you. That's really going to be different. That's really different, actually, is a good word, because all those portfolios tend to look alike. That's what I was trying to say earlier about the competition thing. Is when, when you have a very unique portfolio, it, it really helps your chance of standing out in a good way or in a bad way. That's, I guess it will depend on who's looking at it. But, you know, small schools will probably help you with that. And then again, sometimes small schools have teachers that that will not be able to give you the feedback you need and, and the other thing too is some students will do better in a certain type of environment and some will do better in a different type of environment like all students didn't do good in the school i went to because they needed a more structured approach i would do pretty poorly in a very structured approach because i just am not good at that particular type of thing either so i don't know if you're the type of person who's gonna work really hard on your own or if you're the type of person who needs to be like helped every step of the way and there's nothing wrong with being helped every step of the way. There are people who actually need that and thrive and work extremely well that way. And there are people who are just the opposite, who just need to be let loose. And that's the beauty of art. It's like it, there's as many different types of artists as there are people out there. Well, uh, any parting words you'd like to wrap up with? There's a few things, actually. One thing is, like, I think we're in a phenomenal spot for artists right now. You know, sometimes in the morning, I'll have a conversation with people in Iran, and I'll have a conversation with people in India, and I'll have a uh, conversation with people in, like, Russia, all on the same day, and I'll be able to see work from all those different countries, and they'll look very different. There's so many different ways you can go, and that your way is just as valid as any other way. The, the one thing it does, too, is, like, it makes you a little bit, like, self-conscious, but that's, you know, being an artist, you're going to be self-conscious your whole life. It's gonna help. <laughs> you're going to... You're going to learn to deal with it. I, I still think I can't draw. I just try to like tuck that voice away and just keep going at it and try to like cheat myself into like yeah. pieces of work because uh, I always feel like that. So if you guys feel like that, that you can't draw, that you're not as good as anybody else, don't worry. Yeah, you're just like the rest of us. We all think that. <laughs> you know, take it with a grain of salt, go out for a walk, just live your life. Also, that's another thing I was going to say. Don't stay in front of the computer 24 hours a day seven days a week it's it's go out explore fall in love have your heart broken just you know go meet people go go explore brazil or south america or take a trip to the moon if you can all those experiences you're going to do are going to be food for thought they're going to help you create work they're going to be your your energy you're going to be your your supplies for the, the work you're going to put in but not just the visual impact of going to brazil and seeing the colors but just the smells the feeling the emotions you're going to have going there the hardships that you might encounter on this trip uh if you go to the himalayas you will perceive life in a, life in a different way and it will actually help your 
art and you as a person grow, which, you know, is definitely something that's going to help you in every single aspect of your art and your life. Have experiences, live your life. You're an artist. You're here to like help other people live through you. Basically, you're creating pieces of art, illustrations, sequential art, animation, sculpture, whatever. Uh, you're there because you want to create emotional things, but also you, you're helping other people look at those images and travel, escape, dream, hope. So if you don't have any of that in you, you're going to have a really hard time selling that. So go out and, you know, live your life. What did you learn in this interview that inspired you the most? And how are you going to use this inspiration to guide your own art and creative career? Go to chrisoatley.com forward slash Pascal dash campion dash P2 and join the conversation in the comments. Again, that's chrisoatley.com forward slash Pascal dash campion dash P2 as in part two. I would love to hear your response to this episode, and I know the other listeners will too. Today's breakthrough story comes from Jose Luis Segura. Jose is one of my painting drama students. He's a very wise man, and he's become a good friend. He gives great critiques too, so... I hope he's okay with me telling you that. <laughs> but uh, write him. Maybe he'll give you some of his uh, amazing feedback. Jose writes, The one thing that was an obstacle that caused me the most headache was myself. I kept chasing around endlessly different opportunities without ever really investing myself fully. It took me a few years before I was able to understand who I was and what I wanted. These days, I have a clearer picture of what I want and what I want to do. There wasn't any particular art cast that helped me, but the series as a whole. In time, the message and my path made themselves apparent to me. Chris's art casts gave me hope, and they put certain things in a particular kind of light that forced me to reevaluate what was truly important to me. Everything has slowly sunk in, some more than others. Every day I force myself to push farther in my artistic career and technical goals. I've seen myself grow a lot recently. It actually surprised me. One day I was looking at some of my older work from a couple of years ago and I realized just how much I've improved. I know I did the work, but I'm glad I had Chris's guidance and perspective to help me stay on track. Well, Jose, thank you. Uh, that's uh, it's very encouraging. That's why I do this. That's why I'm here. You can see Jose's work at lucidshanty.com. It's <laughs> an awesome domain name. And you can watch Jose on DeviantArt at twolucid.deviantart.com. That's the number two lucid deviantart.com If this podcast, our blog, our interactions at a convention, or one of the Oatly Academy courses has helped you achieve an artistic or professional breakthrough, you can share your own breakthrough story through our easy upload form at chrisoatley.com forward slash breakthrough. If you are an intermediate digital painter or a beginner who likes to learn quickly by being thrown into the deep end, <laughs> then I encourage you to enroll in the very first digital painting course offered by the Oatly Academy of Concept Art and Illustration. In true Oatly Academy fashion, it has a snappy title. It's called The Magic Box, Everything I Know About Digital Painting. In The Magic Box, I will show you every workflow, every technique, every time saver, everything I have developed over my past eight years of professional digital painting experience, including my time as a visual development artist at Disney. 
The Magic Box will empower and equip you to paint lifelike human and animal characters, to control color, light, and atmosphere, to achieve a professional level of polish and dimension in your work, to avoid overworked paintings and the flat coloring book look forever, to increase your speed and efficiency with versatile techniques that will work in any painting. And of course, to break through the overwhelm of working in Photoshop. Plus, you'll have access to a huge community of passionate, focused artists with whom you can connect and collaborate. So if you want a clear step-by-step -step method designed specifically for concept artists and illustrators, head to chrisotley.com forward slash magic box and enroll today. It's completely risk-free, and you get instant access to the first set of lessons as soon as you enroll. Here are just a few testimonials from current Magic Box students. At John Acuna says, At Chris Oatley, those lighting tutorials helped me make a major breakthrough today. Two days of work done in as many hours. Thanks! At Frederick underscore S says, First time I've looked at a painting I've done and not wanted to scrap it ASAP. Thanks, at Chris Oatley. <laughs> at Thousandfold Art says, At Chris Oatley, that less lesson changed my life, dude. Hashtag magic box. And at Drake Studio says, The magic box courses from at Chris Oatley have made me question my entire digital art workflow. The learning, it hurts. Hurts so good. I <laughs> uh, love you guys. Uh, yes, yeah, so head to chrisoatley.com forward slash magic box to learn more, to enroll, and we would love to see you join the Oatley Academy. <laughs>